Good morning, Renewal and friends. We welcome you to join us as we worship our Lord this morning. Every week we begin with a call to worship and we begin that with one of the Psalms uh, which guides us and directs us to draw our attention to the Lord. And especially this morning, uh, this Psalm is fitting uh, for many of us who are feeling the weight of this week as many tragic events have happened. And so we invite you to allow these words uh, to be the voice and the emotions that may be in your hearts as we seek our Lord, as we turn our attention to a God who listens and who saves and who hears. So I will recite the first parts of the verse and you will respond after me. Deliver me, O Lord, from evil men. Preserve me from violent men who plan evil things in their heart and stir up wars continually. They make their tongue sharp as a serpent's, and under their lips is the venom of asps. Guard me, O Lord, from the hands of the wicked. Preserve me from violent men who have planned to trip up my feet. The arrogant have hidden a trap for me, and with cords they have spread a net. Beside the way they have set snares for me. I say to the Lord, you are my God. Give ear to the voice of my pleas for mercy, O Lord. Grant not, O Lord, the desires of the wicked. Do not further their evil plot, or they will be exalted. I know that the Lord will maintain the cause of the afflicted and will execute justice for the needy. Surely the righteous shall give thanks to your name, the upright shall dwell in your presence. Join me as we pray to our God. Father in heaven, we know this psalm was written by your servant David many, many years ago, and yet they provide words for all of those who seek comfort, hope, and even your righteousness in ourselves and the people around us and in this land. So, Lord, knowing that you do listen to every single prayer, God, receive our cries and our praise and our worship. God, may our worship to you be not contingent on the things around us, but based upon your presence, your solid foundation in our lives. So be worshipped this morning to everyone, to those who have joy, to those who are weeping, to the hungry, the poor, and the weak. May all come to Jesus and be fed. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Let us worship our Lord. Together as we worship our God this morning, um, let's sing our, these songs unto him as uh, worship and a uh, means of honoring him. There is strength within the sorrow There is beauty in our tears And you meet us in our morning With a love that casts out fear You are working in our waiting You're sanctifying us When beyond our understanding You're teaching us to trust Your plans are still to prosper you have not forgotten us You're with us in the fire and the blood You're faithful forever Perfect in love Cause you are sovereign over us And your plans 
Cause your plans are still to prosper You have not forgotten us you're with us in the fire and the flood Cause you're faithful forever Perfect in love Cause you are sovereign over us You're faithful Cause you're faithful forever Perfect in love Cause you are sovereign over us. God's faithfulness. Cause your love is devoted like a ring of solid gold, like a vow that is tested, like a covenant of old. Your love is enduring through the winter rain and beyond the horizon. With mercy for today. Faithful you have been, faithful you will be, you pledge yourself to me, and it's why I sing your praise will never be on my lips, never be on my lips, your praise will never be on my lips, never be on my lips. Father the orphan, cause you father the orphan, your kindness makes us so, and you shoulder our weakness, and your strength becomes our own, cause you're making me like you, clothing me in white, bringing beauty from my shades, for you will have your bride. Free of all her guilt, rid of all her shame, known by her true name. And it's why I sing your praise will never be on my lips, never be on my lips. Your praise will never be on my lips, never be on my lips. Your praise will never be on my lips. Never be on my lips, your praise will never be on my lips, never be on my lips. You will be praised, you will be praised. With angels and saints, we sing worthy are you, Lord. You will be praised, you will be praised. With angels and saints we sing, worthy are you, Lord. And it's why I sing your praise will never be on my lips, never be on my lips. Your praise will never be on my lips, never be on my lips. Your praise will never be on my lips. Never be on my lips, your praise will never be on my lips, never be on my lips, your praise will never be on my lips, never be on my lips, your praise will never be on my lips, never be on my lips, your praise will never be on my lips, never be on my lips, your praise will Never be on my lips, never be on my lips.
as we seek the Lord and praise and worship him, we also do so by turning our hearts to him. And we turn to him as we turn away from sin. These past few weeks, we've been going through the book of 1 John. And bit by bit, we've been learning to see what it means to be a follower of Christ and what it means to love one another. And that will be the theme of our confession this morning, coming from 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 11. So allow these words to speak to you and guide our time of uh, uh, repentance this morning. I will read this for us. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins, beloved. If God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. With that in our hearts, join me as we pray this prayer together so that we can love one another the way that God intends us to. We thank you, our God, for not only saving us as individuals, but knitting us together in community as the body of Christ. We thank you for your gospel that changes us to love those whom we fear, envy, or disdain. We thank you that as a community of fellow sufferers, we can find compassion and care in our time of need. We thank you that as a community of fellow sin strugglers, we can find grace and truth to help us grow in holiness. Father, forgive us for the ways we don't demonstrate the gospel to one another. As messy and broken as your church can be, Grow us as a people where those who are spiritually weary can find rest, where those who mourn can find comfort, where those who are alone can find fellowship, where those who sin can find the Savior, where those who struggle can find victory. To the glory of our head, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Let us now take time to personally repent in any of the ways that we have not loved our brothers and sisters to those that God has placed around us. So let's ask the Spirit, search our hearts. Reveal to me any type of disdain or hate that I've had for my brothers and sisters, and let us repent. Brothers and sisters, we know that the command to love one another does not come empty, but it is grounded upon this unchanging truth, this truth that God first loves us, and with that, be equipped, be motivated, be excited even to love those around us. Hear this word from John 15. Jesus says this, As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. With that assurance in our hearts, let us now recite and affirm our faith by saying the Luzon Covenant of Faith. We affirm our belief in the one eternal God, creator and lord of the world father son and holy spirit 
who governs all things according to the purpose of his will. He has been calling out from the world a people for himself and sending them back into the world to be his servants and his witnesses for the extension of his kingdom, the building up of Christ's body, and the glory of his name. We confess with shame that we have often denied our calling and failed in our mission by becoming conformed to the world or by withdrawing from it. Yet we rejoice that even when born by earthen vessels, the gospel is still a precious treasure and to the task of making that treasure known in the power of the Holy Spirit, we desire to dedicate ourselves anew. Amen. Let us continue in worship.
Lord, we come to you today asking that you would increase in us our affection and our desire for you. Lord Jesus, you would be our greatest treasure, our precious pearl that we hold on to, that we long for, that we desire every single day of our lives, that motivates us to live for you and for your kingdom. Give us your strength to worship you this moment. Give us your strength and your love to worship and honor you with our lives each and every day. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Having received and having sung of his forgiveness, let us now look outward and lift up all those not only inside of our church, but outside of our church. And we'll do that this morning uh, by praying for those in our country uh, who need much of our prayers. And we'll also continue praying for the world. So first, uh, let us pray for many of the tragic events that occurred this past week, uh, starting with uh, the killing of Jacob Blake and the Kenosha community. Let's pray for his recovery. Let's also pray for those as they witness or experienced uh, such events uh, for some of the trauma that may occur in their hearts and their minds as well for those who are hurting, that God will be a source of comfort, that brothers and sisters will come together to love one another as we have shared this morning. So let's pray for them. Let's pray for the victims who are suffering from the hurricane down south, uh, that God will use um, many people and supporters and volunteers to help with the recovery process. And let's also pray for the continued uh, victims of the pandemic. Uh, let's pray especially for India as well, as many, many deaths have risen recently. There are many things to pray for, so let us take a minute and pray for all of those things, especially the things that God has placed on your heart. So join me in prayer. God, we believe you know every single person in this world. You know all of those who need to hear your comfort and to feel your presence in their lives. God, to those people especially, tell them how you are with them and present to them the love of Jesus Christ. We pray for victims. We pray for the repentance of those who cause and harm others. We do pray, Lord, that your church, as weak and as inadequate as we are, may we continue to be on our knees, act with our hands and feet as well, especially to those around us. God, we ask for your help. We ask for your peace. In your son's name we pray, amen. We'll continue to pray for the nations. Every week we highlight a different nation, understanding that there is many things going on and they need our prayers. So this week we'll be praying for the country of the Netherlands and our sister Mary Wu will be praying for us. This morning we'll be praying for the Netherlands. This prosperous Western European state is known for its tolerance, but it's been fraying as cultural, political, social tensions have occurred and multiplied over issues such as anti-immigration agendas. Christianity has reached a low point in the Netherlands. About only 16% of the population attends church regularly. However, it has a glorious history of being a haven for refugees and a long record in foreign missions. Um, many of the church buildings have been abandoned or transformed into homes and shops. However, parts of Netherlands retain a vibrant church um, due to the arrival of migrant communities with a strong Christian population. This morning, perhaps we can focus on two aspects uh, to pray for them. One, we can pray for the church um, that, and for Christians that after decades that they would be devoted to Christ. And two, we can pray for um, the Netherlands to continue to be a haven for refugees, for those who are homeless and are seeking 
um, a place of safety um, through the church and their communities. Let us pray. Let us pray together. God, we thank you for the way that you love the Netherlands. We're thankful for their rich history of serving the oppressed and those in need and for the way that you have shaped the country. We pray for safety and a smooth adjustment for current refugees in, Netherla in the Netherlands and we ask that you would use Christians and churches to be a source of healing and recovery for them. God, it must ache you to see so many people fall away from you and for churches to become commercial properties. But we trust in the hope and the power that you provide. We pray for receptive, open hearts to be committed to your word and that their reputation of tolerance or any barriers would be broken down by the power of the Holy Spirit. God, we ask that the migrant communities and missionaries would be filled with the Holy Spirit to boldly speak of you in power and in love. As churches in the Netherlands worship you this week, we pray believers in their communities would be transformed by the gospel and to produce much fruit for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Welcome once again. Uh, it is a pleasure and joy to have you worship with us. My name is Luke Wu. I am one of the pastors. And here, I would like to highlight some announcements for us. First, I would like to share if you are new or this is one of the first few times that you're joining us in our virtual worship, we want to get to know you. Please help us to get to know you by filling out this form on this website, renewalmainline.org slash new. And there you can just tell us a little bit about yourselves and we can tell you how you can get more connected to our church. Next, I want to remind everyone that uh, we can currently give online our tithes and our offerings uh, to the church through our website under resources, or you can mail checks. And let's just take a few seconds now, if you're one of those, or one of our members who give in this way, uh, to just tell the Lord, Lord God, this is for you. Let's just take a few seconds and do that as we remind ourselves that we are stewards of his money. And if you are new here, please do not feel obligated uh, to give. Next, we'll be beginning our community groups uh, for the fall, the week of September 6th. So it will happen on the weekend. And community groups are scheduled uh, 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 for, uh, to happen that second week. But if you're not in one, uh, please let us know by going to that address and so that we can have you uh, connected uh, with one of the leaders who can tell you more about when they meet, uh, where they meet, virtual meeting information, and all of that. So please, if you're not in a community group, uh, it is one of the primary ways uh, you can be connected with others in our church. So please consider joining one. Next, if you're a parent uh, with children anywhere from nursery to fifth grade, uh, we invite you to join us for our yearly info session. Um, we want to give this info session every year uh, just to remind our parents uh, just our vision for our children's ministry and go over specific information, especially as it pertains to our weekly Sunday worship uh, in light of our virtual services as well. So please uh, mark your calendars for that. If you have any questions, if you want to join the parent listserv, please email Samantha. And next, we want to continue to welcome our college students, especially our BICO students who are now getting situated back on campus. Uh, please join us on Zoom every Friday night at 8 p.m. or we'll connect with one another and hear God's word. And we'll also have community groups happening uh, in smaller gatherings as well. So please, if you're not in a community group, again, email Pastor David and you can join one with other students. And finally, uh, we want to offer just any kind of spiritual, emotional, or financial help uh, to those who need it. So if you uh, need any of these things, please email us at diaconate at renewalmainline.org. And I want to just give one quick word. Uh, in light of many of the events that have happened, uh, we know that uh, much trauma uh, can be ignited in many of us. And so if that is you, please do not think that this is not uh, the place or the time 
or the way for you to receive that kind of comfort, we invite you. Uh, we want to join with you, pray together, and find ways that we can console one another with God's word and God's truth. So please do not hesitate to contact us. This time, we'll begin our time in uh, looking at God's word, and we're going to have Pastor Bill continue to preach for us. So as I invite him up, uh, please get your Bibles ready, and he'll lead our time. Good morning. My name is Bill Smith. I am one of the pastors here at Renewal Main Line. Uh, before we dive into today's passage, I want to take a few moments and just have a small pastoral uh, minute, few minutes with you to think about the larger world. We'll shorten the, the sermon on the other side of this. But I want us to think carefully about a world that seems to have lost its mind. Our world is very unsettled. It's very raw. Each new tragedy hits so quickly with increasing force, it's hard to even recover from the last one. Very much appreciate the opportunity to lament this morning from our call to worship, from our corporate prayer. It's very good to do that. It's good to know that God invites us to bring our feelings to him. Good to know that he gives us ways to actually express our feelings to him. And you need to do that. I'm going to encourage you to keep doing that. It's good, but you're also going to need more than that. You need to have ways of thinking about all the things that are going on in this world. You need ways of thinking about why injustice just will not go away. You need ways of thinking about why our country is so divided and at war with itself. You need ways of thinking about why natural disasters keep destroying lives and property, why plagues sweep across the planet. If you're not ready to think about those kinds of ways this morning, you're, you're still feeling a little bit raw, let me urge you, just keep grieving. But when the Lord meets you, and he will, when the Lord meets you and it's time to think, one of the places you might consider going to would be Matthew chapter 24. This is a time where Jesus' disciples were with him at the temple, and it's toward the end of his ministry. They wanted to know what would signal the end times, and most specifically, what would signal Jesus' return. I'm not sure that his answer is exactly what they were looking for. He says to them, verse 4, Watch out that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, claiming, I am the Messiah, and will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of birth pains. Then you'll be handed over to be persecuted and put to death, and you'll be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations and then the end will come. Now, did you hear what he just said? He just told them that many people would try to deceive them, that they would be handed over to be persecuted and put to death and hated by all nations because of him. He was speaking to them of what would happen to them, and he went on and said, that's just the beginning. It's the birth pains, the beginning of birth pains, that this would continue until the gospel of the kingdom was preached throughout the entire world. Only then will the end come. In other words, what he said to them was, the end times are here right now. That was 2,000 years ago. They've already started. But he also said the end times will continue until he returns, which means right now you and I live when? We live in the end times. So what is it that you can expect in this time, this time of the end? You can expect nation to be set against nation. Kingdom set against kingdom, political party against political party. That's normal in the end times. Don't expect a utopia here. Expect that the love of many will grow cold. Expect that what is going to govern the world is hatred and violence. That's what you should expect. And you should expect more. You should expect famines and earthquakes. Natural disasters, hurricanes that kill and destroy, plagues that sweep the planet and keep you locked inside your home. You can expect all that. 
You can also expect messiahs, many messiahs to appear, many false prophets who will appear and tell you, I have the answer. Follow me and we'll remake this whole world. Jesus says, don't be deceived. Don't be fooled. Don't be taken in. But he also says, verse 6, see to it that you're not alarmed. That's his point. That's why he's telling you all of this. It's so that you're not going to be jerked around by every event that takes place. Don't be alarmed, but he also says, don't be complacent. He says the gospel of the kingdom will be preached to all nations. Well, how does it get preached? Someone has to preach it. Someone has to take it. It must be preached to all nations. In other words, Jesus is saying, you have something to do. You are to proclaim the gospel. You are to proclaim what Jesus has done for you and what he would be willing to do for everyone else. Now, why is it that that is his call to action? It's because it's in the gospel that there is power to change the world. And the power to change the world takes place one person at a time as one person goes from being a hater to a lover. That's what the gospel does. Jesus says the love of most will grow cold. doesn't say the love of everyone. Instead, there will be those who are touched by the gospel. Those, if you want to paraphrase Jimi Hendrix, those who will have the love of power replaced by the power of love. Those who will be transformed from haters to lovers. So brothers and sisters, this is a gentle word to you that says don't expect a calm world. But you can expect to be calm within this world that is full of turmoil. And as you are calm, you also need to be intentional. You need to take this message of the kingdom to the larger world. That's what we talked about yesterday at our annual prep and prayer day. It's the day when we get all the leaders of the church together for the start of the new ministry year. And if you weren't able to be there, we recorded the uh, big picture message, and you really should listen to that. And I'm going to be a little bit stronger. You need to listen to that. I'm going to urge you. The church word for that is encourage, but it really means you need to do this. You need to listen to that message. Why? It lays out why ministry to this world is absolutely necessary. It lays out why you are the ones that Jesus is entrusting this ministry to, and it gives you a couple ideas of what you should be doing in that. I'm strongly urging you, encouraging you, to listen to it. It'll help you understand a little bit more. Here's what we have at the heart of Renewal Mainline, and we have it at the heart of Renewal Mainline because it's what's at the heart of God. Message is available online now as one of our podcasts. You don't need to be a leader in the church to listen to it. You can be a, a member. You can be a regular attender. You can be a visitor. It doesn't matter. You need to listen to it. Lots going on in the world right now. It's going to continue to be that way. You need to be calm, and you need to be involved. So to that end, let me pray for us. Lord, our world has been rocked again by evil this past week. You promised that it would be. Lord, it doesn't make it any easier to hear the news feeds, to hear of Jacob Blake, to hear of the others who were murdered in Kenosha. Lord, it doesn't make it any easier to hear of the devastation of the latest hurricane or the continued spread of this virus. Lord, our world is broken, and you promised it would be. But you also promised that you would be in charge, that such things had to happen, and that you would bring things to an end. And I have to confess, I, I don't really understand why that's necessary. But Lord, I know that you entered into this world with all that craziness, and you entered into it with a purpose, and I trust you. And so, Lord, will you then move us to action, not to complacency and not to fear and alarm. Lord, give us confidence in you, and then send us out on the same mission that you yourself came and brought to this planet. Thank you for rescuing us. Lord, thank you for giving us the ability to come to you with our concerns. Thank you for calming them. And thank you for giving us things to do in the middle of them. In Jesus' name, amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from John chapter 21. John chapter 1, 21, beginning in verse 1. After this... Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. 
Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any fish? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work, and threw himself into the sea. The other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place, with fish laid out on it, and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them. And so with the fish, this was now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. We're coming to the end of our teaching series in the book of John. We only have two messages left, one this week and then one next. Both come from the, a strange chapter that almost feels like an add-on to the book. Last week we saw the climax of the book in chapter 20. Three different appearances of Jesus after his resurrection to three very distinct groups of people. And as we've been seeing all summer long, Jesus engaged those three different kinds of people in three very different ways based on their needs. And as he did so, we saw that God has a heart for these kinds of people. God has a heart for the marginalized, those who are living on the outskirts of society. He has a heart for moral failures who can't seem to live up to what they know is right and good. He has a heart for radical skeptics who are struggling with their doubts. These are the people that are on God's heart in a special way. We saw that last week, and so you come to chapter 21, and I have to start wondering, what are we going to see here that we haven't seen already? John told us that he could fill the world with books about all the things that Jesus did, that he has lots and lots of material at his disposal. So whatever he writes is because it tells us something about that, that's essential about our God and is essential for our faith in this God. So what then does chapter 21 add? Well, it's amazing to see Jesus appear to his disciples after they had rejected him. That's amazing grace. But it does kind of leave a question hanging out there. How does he really feel about them? Okay, he came to them, that was good, but they had rejected him. They rejected him after promising not to abandon him, and so their failure is not a failure in the abstract. Their failure is personal. They failed him. They broke trust with him. They couldn't handle the pressure of the moment. They went back on their word. They did what they said they wouldn't do, and they broke their relationship. You can imagine, then, the questions that are sort of hanging out there. Where, where does that leave us with Jesus? How's he feeling about us? It's true of all of the disciples, especially true of Peter. Peter had led the charge about how loyal he was going to be, how, he, much, how, how much he would sacrifice to remain loyal, even if that meant he had to die in the process, He's a little bit more in the foreground than the rest of the disciples, and then he, in the foreground, denies Christ. Where does he now stand with Jesus? Now, let me ask you, kind of an aside, let me ask you first, what do you do when someone breaks your trust? When someone violates their relationship with you? When someone turns their back on you, or when someone waits for you to turn their back and then they stab you in it? What do you do when someone that you had been close to lies to you or they lie about you or they ignore you, they mistreat you, they shut you out, they break their agreement with you? What do you do when you feel betrayed? I was talking with a man one time. He described a friend that he had grown up with in school and this friend did something to him that, that felt like such a violation of their friendship that this man told me, I cut him off. Right then and there, we'd hung out for years, we'd been in each other's houses, we knew each other's families, but I never spoke to him again. And he said it with a sense of pride, a sense of this is how strong I am relationally, you will never hurt me again. 
That's one way people deal with betrayal. They cocoon themselves. They withdraw into themselves. They build walls between themselves and other people. They wrap themselves with thick layers of gauze to guard and protect themselves. Other people don't go quite as far as this man did, but they go down similar roads. They withhold their heart from someone else. They're cold to that other person. They give the other person the silent treatment. They hold themselves back from the person who's hurt them. It looks strong, but it isn't. It's self-protective. They harden themselves so they can't be hurt without realizing that that hardness now does what? It prevents them from having any relationship and having any connection. It's one way of handling betrayal. It's more of the passive way, guard yourself. You do whatever you have to do so that you won't be hurt again. There's also a more active way of handling betrayal, a little more aggressive, which is essentially to say, I will make you pay for what you did to me. I will punish you. Some people make other people pay physically. They're threatening. Some people are abusive physically. Some people are directly physically abusive. Some people are indirectly physically abusive. They throw things at the walls. They break things. They slam doors. They stomp around. Other people punish more verbally than they do physically. They yell and scream. They badger the other person with questions. They insult them. They berate them. They insist on bringing the same thing up over and over and over and over and over again until they drive it into the ground, until they drive the other person into the ground with it. And they do all of that to communicate very simply, I will make you pay. So that what? So that you'll know I'm serious. And so that you will think twice. You will think many more times than twice before you ever pull a stunt like that again. Because if you do, you know exactly what's waiting for you on the other end of that. Now, very interesting. Think about all of these strategies, the passive ones, the aggressive ones. You think about all these strategies as different as they all are, they actually have one thing in common. Not one of them is motivated by love. They're not strategies that begin by thinking, what does this other person need? This person who has violated our friendship, who's broken our relationship. This person has been faithless. They've been captured by faithlessness. Now, what do they need in order to become a faithful person who loves faithfully? None of those earlier strategies think like that. They're not restorative strategies. They're all self-serving. They're all self-protective. And therefore, what do they do? They further harm the relationship. They are faithless ways of handling faithlessness. And when you engage in them, you will ruin the relationship that much more. Because instead of just one person sinning against the relationship, now you have two. Now, did the first person start it? Well, of course they did. But does that first violation of trust justify the second violation? Does it justify additional third, fourth, eighth, eighteenth violations? Of course not. At which point someone's going to say, okay, now I feel like you've kind of led me into this cul-de-sac. I feel like there's no real good answer here. If protecting myself is bad and if punishing the other person is bad, what am I supposed to do? I'm just supposed to put up with whatever they've done? I, I just pretend it wasn't as bad as it was, that it didn't really bother me, that, that they can do whatever they want, whenever they want, and, and I just have to get over it. Is that what you're telling me? That's not what Scripture tells you. That's not what God does when you break trust with Him. How do you know that? John chapter 21. Here you see Jesus engaging with a group of guys, especially Peter, who have violated their friendship with Him and broken His trust. And he neither protects himself or punishes them. Instead, by the end of the chapter, you realize that what he's done is restore Peter. He's restored him relationally, and he's restored Peter to his place in ministry. Now, to discover how that's possible, you have to ask two questions, two questions that we'll try to answer today. First, what do you need to do when trust is broken? How do you need to respond when someone violates your trust, when they break relationship? What do you need to do? And then secondly, what do you trust in that lets you do that? What are you trusting in other than protecting yourself or punishing them? What are you trusting in that allows you to respond differently? So what do you need to do? 
And what do you trust in when someone breaks your trust? Just two points today. I shouldn't have to say this, but I'm going to anyway. Today's not going to answer all of your questions about how to restore relationships. There's a lot more that can be said. Today's not exhaustive, but today does what? It gives us a good start. It gives us a start that will keep us from making things worse. It gives us a start that will open a door to restoration. So let's get started. What do you need to do when trust is broken? Jesus does two things here. First, he moves toward the person who's hurt him. Verse 4, he stands on the shore of where the disciples are fishing. He's gone looking for them, and he's found them. He puts himself into their general vicinity. He enters into their world. He doesn't wait for them to come find him. Then, verse 5, he calls to them. He initiates a conversation with them. He doesn't stand there silently on the shore waiting for them to row in and then start talking with him. Just like when he appeared to them twice before, he goes to them, and he is the one who breaks the ice. He starts the conversation he initiates. But he does more than simply initiate. He communicates, secondly, in his initiation, that he has good intentions. Verse 5, he uses a word of intimacy. Our translation, uh, in our translation, he calls to them children, which is a literal translation of the word he used. But when you use it in this context, it actually has a different connotation than older, younger. According to the lexicon used in this context, what's in view is affection. The word signals that there is a special relationship here, a relationship of endearment. So Jesus is not demeaning them by calling them children. He's telling them, you're special to me. You are friends. I am friendly. And his words communicate, here's how I feel about you. They communicate his goodness. But more than what he says, however, is what he does. They get on land and they discover, verse 9, that he's been making breakfast and that it's for them. He invites them, verse 12, to a warm meal after they've been working all night. Verse 13, he serves them personally. Now, what is he doing? He's signaling his heart for them in his words and in his actions. He's letting them know that he is for them, not against them, that he's thinking about them, that despite what they've done, he still has their best interests at heart. They have been faithless to him, and he remains faithful to them. And they know that by how he acts toward them. So let me ask you, is that how people experience you? When someone sins against you, do they find you warm? Do they find you inviting? Do they find you welcoming? Do they find you still committed to them and still committed to your relationship with them? Do they find you spending lots and lots of your energy to let them know that? Is that how people experience you? Now let me confess something. This is hard. This is hard for me personally. I don't think I'm alone in this, but it's hard for me to communicate friendliness when I don't feel friendly. It's easier for me to shut down, easier for me to hold a grudge. About 15 years ago, I wrote in one of my books about one of the contrasts between my wife Sally and I, about how when she forgives me, she, she lets things go. She doesn't treat me according to the ways that I really deserve to be treated which has been amazing to me to experience. It's taught me an awful lot about God's grace, in part because I find it really hard to let things go. I find it very hard to be warm, like I was not very warm this past week with someone in my family. I find it very hard. And when you hold a grudge, when I hold a grudge, when you feel like you've been sinned against, it's so hard to go to that other person and restart the relationship. You feel like, I shouldn't be doing this. I'm not the one who screwed everything up between the two of us. You should be the first one to make a move here. And I really don't want to communicate good feelings until you start first. Because you might take advantage of me again. It's been very good to see that over the past 15 years, I've grown. I think I'm more gracious than I was. But when I look at Jesus standing there on the shore, when I look at myself this past week, I realized how much further I still have to go. So I'm asking, please pray for me. I'm not just speaking to you. Scripture here is speaking to me. So first, what do you need to do when someone breaks your trust? You need to go to them. You need to go with an attitude that says, I still care about you. I want you back. But second, what do you trust in? 
What gives you the inner strength to go to somebody with that kind of attitude? What gives you the energy, the power, the confidence to go to someone who's already proven they can't be trusted? What motivates you? What do you trust in when someone else can't be? Well, there are two bad options here. Option one, you figure, well, I, you just have to trust them anyway. You have to trust that their goodness, that their concern for you, that their ability to overcome their weaknesses is going to be strong enough that they can be trusted, which frankly sounds like a horrible idea. They've just shown you that they can fail you. They may not want to fail, but clearly they're able to. So deciding to rest all your weight on them feels like you have to shut your brain off, like you have to play let's pretend with your relationship. Let's pretend that you won't ever let me down again. That doesn't seem reasonable. It, it certainly doesn't seem hopeful. So if you can't trust the other person, option two, you're left having to trust yourself. You have to trust your ability to police the other person, to hold them accountable so they can't sin against you again. And so you have to check their computer history. You have to take away their access to credit cards and to bank accounts. You have to badger them with questions about where they were and what they were doing. None of which makes the other person feel like you're for them. Worse, it makes you realize you don't have a true friendship. Because the quality of the relationship now depends completely on how well you are able to stay on top of what they're doing. And so it starts to feel like the friendship is only as good as you are. Not as good as both of you could make it. And you're afraid then that as soon as you let up, it's going to go downhill again. Both of those options cannot be what Jesus is trusting as he's standing on the shore of the sea, calling out to the disciples. Think about it for a moment. You realize it's not what he trusts in his relationship with you either. Jesus never makes you feel like he's playing. Let's pretend that you're better than you are. And you also never feel like he's smothering you constantly on you. How is that possible? How can he give himself to relationship? How can he give and give and give and give and give without giving up? It's because of the resurrection. His resurrection introduces a third option because his death and his resurrection bring a new reality into play. Think about the passage and you realize here that you have hints, you have indicators of the resurrection. Verse 4, it's early in the morning, just at the break of day. And that's language that's intended to take you back to chapter 20, verse 1, where Mary Magdalene went to the tomb, quote, while it was still dark. As Jesus is standing there at the break of day on the shore, it's a small hint, it's an indicator that you have a similar kind of setting. It reminds you, Jesus has risen. And it's telling you, don't forget it. There is a new reality that's taken place. Something new has broken into this world from outside. Something that is much stronger than all of the sin that controls everything that takes place here in this world. It's early in the morning. The resurrection is here. You have another hint. Down in verse 12, Jesus doesn't look like he used to. Did you catch, did you catch how strange verse 12 is? None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. In other words, they really wanted to ask a question. They really wanted to look at him and say, who are you? But they didn't dare. They didn't dare because underneath they really knew who he was, but the question was still in their minds. How does that make any sense? It has to be because Jesus doesn't look like what they remembered. Similar when Mary Magdalene meets him for the first time in the garden uh, after he's risen, and she doesn't recognize him at first. She thinks he's the gardener until he talks to her. Similar to the ways that the disciples on the road to Emmaus, they don't recognize who they're talking to all day either. His disciples have to see him by the, and know him by the scars. His body after the resurrection doesn't look like his former body, and it's another hint, it's another reminder here of the reality of the resurrection. The reality of the resurrection is right there in that moment. Jesus has brought it with him. There's some other changes too, not just in Jesus, but there's something different about creation, something you catch a glimpse of in this miracle. Honestly, don't you think this miracle is kind of weird? I mean, it, it, it's a strange miracle. Jesus already has fish cooking. Why do they need to catch any? He doesn't need their help getting breakfast for them. He's already got fish there, so why tell them to cast the net on the other side? 
Think about the picture that you're being offered here. Before Jesus says anything, the water is barren. It's empty. The guys take all night proving that. They fish all night. They catch nothing. Then the resurrected, resurrected Christ shows up, and suddenly when he speaks, that's all it takes, when he speaks, the water is now full of fish. It's teeming with fish. It's swarming with fish, where previously there were no fish. And I'm using those words very intentionally, teeming, swarming, because they translate a word that you find way back in Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, when God is creating the world, and he's speaking to the world that he's making. And at one point, he says, let the waters swarm with swarms of living creatures. And when he says that, the water that previously was empty, devoid of living creatures, is now full, swarming with these living things. And once it is swarming, God stops and he gives his stamp of approval. He says, that's good. That's the way it should be. What's this tell you? It tells you that a world without fish is bad. It's not the way that the world should be. God made this world to be rich, full, abundant, swarming with living creatures. When it's not, what are you seeing? You're seeing that the curse is in control. And so the guys spent all night long living in a cursed world. What Jesus' miracle from the shore tells you is that the power of that curse has been broken. The renewal of all things has begun. The restoration of all that's been broken is here. The power of the curse is broken. The nets are full. You've now entered into a world where your labor is rewarded. The nets are full, but they don't break, which is also new. Under the curse, creation fights against you. Nothing works the way that it's supposed to. God cursed the ground after Adam and Eve sinned. He said, thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. You can't do anything easily in this world. Something always resists you and resists what you're trying to do. Fishing nets break in this world if they're too full. But at the word of the risen Christ, the nets are full and they don't break. The futility of living in a cursed world is being taken away. Creation is no longer fighting the children of God. Why do you need chapter 21? Why do you need to know this miracle? It tells you that you're standing at the dawn of a new creation. You're standing at the break of, the day, of day after a long, dark, futile, exhausting night. A night of living and toiling in the old creation, and now all of that is changing. The sun is rising on the new creation. A new day is upon you. It's overseen. It's organized by the risen Lord. A new day that's about a whole lot more than fish. A new day that is about you. It's about all of the children of God. It's a new day that says, if simple things like fish and nets work now the way they are supposed to, now that Christ has risen, how much more will the children of God work the way that they are supposed to? That's the point of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. In verse 17, we learn that if anyone is in Christ, connected to Christ, united with Christ. If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. And because the old has passed away, verse 16, we no longer regard anyone according to the flesh. Or as other translations put it, we no longer regard anyone from a worldly point of view. We no longer look at someone and say, there's no hope for you. You're always going to be like that. Why don't we say that? It's not because we have such great confidence in that person. It's because we have such great confidence in the new creation. We have confidence in verse 14 that Christ died for us. And therefore, since we are in him, we're joined with him, we also died to what? To the old creation. We have confidence that we died to the old creation and its ways of living because we died to its controlling power over us. We have confidence in the gospel that what Jesus did wasn't enough simply to hope that someone could be different. We have confidence that what Jesus did guarantees that they will be different. That's why Jesus is standing there welcoming his guys with open arms, Peter included. He's not putting his hope and trust in Peter, that Peter's never going to fail him again. Read the book of Galatians, you discover that Peter did fail again. Jesus is putting his hope in his own resurrection 
The resurrection has pulled Peter out of the old creation, made him part of the new, and now because of that, what is most true of Peter is what he will be, not what he was. And the question then is, do you believe that? Do you believe that the resurrection is so powerful that it will overcome every bit of brokenness in someone when Jesus makes them part of the new creation? Do you believe that? Say, well, how how do you know if you do or, or don't? Listen to your self-talk when someone sins against you. What is it that goes through your mind when your spouse breaks your trust? What goes through your mind when your child sins against you or your parent or your friend sins against you? Do you think, do you think things like, oh, what's the use? Why even bother trying? She won't listen. He'll never change. When you think like that, you're considering someone from a worldly point of view. If they're a Christian, you're denying the power of the resurrection in their life. You're saying it won't work for them. They're always going to be what they were. If they're not yet a Christian, you're saying they're never going to be a Christian. But how do you know that? What right do you have to be hopeless about them? How do you know, in fact, that this failure that you're now struggling with is not what Jesus will use to actually bring them to himself? When you think hopeless thoughts about someone, about anyone, you're considering them from a worldly point of view. You're saying people don't change. You're saying past failures are indicative of future performance, that their past controls them. You're saying the power of the resurrection, the new creation cannot affect their life. You're denying the resurrection. And when you do that, You're looking at people through the lens of the curse, which means what? It means you are caught up. You are controlled in that moment by an old creation view of life, a pre-resurrection view of life. You're not living out of the new creation. And here's the wonder of the gospel. In that moment, Jesus does not lose hope for you. Just like he came to Peter and to the disciples, he comes to you and says, now that I've been raised from the dead, Nothing has to remain the same. Nothing has to be what it was, not even you. And Peter understands that. (laughs) You look at that mad dash he makes to get to Jesus, throws himself into the water. You don't do that unless you know what? You know that you will be received. Jesus sees him. And because Jesus sees him in this new way, through the lens of the New creation. Nothing will get into Peter's way of getting to Jesus. When you know that you belong to Christ, that you're part of this new creation world, you will run just that fast. Do you know that? Do you know that's how Jesus sees you? As part of the new creation, fully confident that you will not be what you were, but that you will be just like him. If you're not running to Jesus as fast as Peter is when you have sinned against other people, If you are holding yourself back from Jesus, the answer is no. You haven't yet understood how Christ sees you. You haven't yet understood what his resurrection means for you. And if you hold yourself back from others when they have sinned against you, or if you make them pay for what they've done, you haven't yet understood what the resurrection means for them, and you haven't yet understood what the resurrection means for you. And the good news of the gospel is that you could. Tell Jesus that you want him to find you, that you want him to come looking for you, that you want to experience the reality of the resurrection in your life, that you want to be done with the old creation. You want to be done with old creation ways of living, with old creation ways of seeing things, and that you want to live in the power of this new day that he's brought. Tell him that, and he will come. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you for opening the door to a whole new reality. Lord, thank you that we do not have to be what we were. Lord, that we do not need to sin against you. We don't need to sin against others. That we don't need to take others' sin against us as though it was ultimate. Thank you, Lord, that you have come to rescue us, to restore us, to bring us into this glorious new creation. Thank you, Lord, that that will be our destiny because of what you have done. In Jesus' name, amen. 
close this time with this song, um, just reflecting upon this gift of Christ, um, remembering that by his blood we are received, we are accepted as we are, and may we find hope and joy in that. Gifts of grace is Jesus, my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom, my steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing, all is mine, yet not I, but through Christ. Thank you. 
you would, receive the benediction of your God. Now may the God of peace sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will surely do it. Go now in peace as you live in the new creation.